Great. So welcome back. Um, our next speaker is Jacob Steinhardt. He's an assistant professor of statistics here at Berkeley. Cool. Uh, thanks. Yeah, sorry about the technical difficulties, but I think we have things uh, set out today. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about some recent work uh, with my student Mina Jagadisan and uh, collaborator Keel Garg on supply side equilibrium recommender systems. So just to kind of set the stage here, um, the kind of motivation is that a lot of content these days is digital. It's kind of distributed uh, over the internet. And this distribution is mediated by recommender systems such as Netflix, uh, Spotify, things like this. Um, and so this kind of, uh, these recommender systems create a kind of marketplace where producers are competing with each other to be recommended to users. So they're trying to create the content that will be uh, most recommended. And uh, this marketplace induces a bunch of competitive effects. So uh, an example is, you know, for instance, on YouTube, people will often create very salient images as the kind of uh, splash image to try to get people to click. Uh, to some extent, the recommender system actually, you know, kind of explicitly promotes that. To some extent, this is just what kind of causes users to click on things. Uh, you'll have uh, hooks in songs to try to get people to keep listening to them uh, because of sort of how the pricing model in Spotify works. Um, and so there's all of these kind of strategic effects that you get from these recommender systems. And in this talk, um, I'm going to be focusing on uh, one particular effect, which is the emergence of genres, or, or in some cases where you already had genres, the emergence of uh, micro genres. So, um, so as an example, you know, in movies where I guess used to genres, like you have kind of, um, you know, action movies, comedies, uh, things like this. Uh, but once you have uh, things like, like Netflix that are making very personalized recommendations, there's even some evidence of getting even more fine grained genres. So particular, you know, styles of say romantic comedies that uh, cater particular to particular users. And so uh, we kind of want to understand this. And so I'm going to, present uh, maybe the sort of simplest uh, possible, but still a fairly interesting theoretical model that allows us to kind of get at this effect and then try to understand uh, Nash equilibria in this model. So here's uh, the kind of formal setting that we're going to consider. We're going to imagine a setting where we have N users, U1 through UN. Uh, each user we're going to represent as a vector that denotes uh, essentially their preferences, right? So in the movie regime, maybe the user has like some preference for really good cinematography, some preference for, you know, action scenes, some preference for, I don't know, like Tom Cruise being one of the actors or maybe a, a preference against it. I don't know, although, although in this case, we'll assume that all preferences are, are at least a non-negative linear combination of, uh, of the attributes. So each user has this preference vector and then in addition, there's going to be P producers. And for simplicity, we'll assume each producer creates just one good. So, you know, maybe you have a conglomerate that produces lots of movies, but we'll think of each team as, you know, some mini producer. So each producer produces one good. So they, uh, they're acting strategically. So they're choosing content and will denote the content that producer uh, J produces as PJ, which is also going to be this non-negative vector in RD. And so the value that a user uh, assigns to a given piece of content is just given by the dot product between these two. So between the user's preferences and the attributes. Um, and so we'll also just assume that our recommender system is actually uh, perfect. So it always assigns uh, a, a user the good that has the most uh, similar content. So the thing that would produce the most value to them. So, uh, this is pretty simple, but there's already some key properties that kind of depart from many classical models of economic competition. Uh, so the main one is that we have this very high dimensional decision space, right? Because each producer is actually picking some multi-dimensional vector in RD. Uh, typically, uh, models of kind of competition would often either have uh, choices from some finite choice set, or if you have something continuous, it would be some one dimensional quantity like price. Um, there's some exceptions like uh, hotelian style games where you might be uh, choosing locations, uh, but even those end up being uh, 
fairly different, we'll see, from this model. Uh, the other thing is that you have this heterogeneous user base, right? So users have not just multiple types, but could kind of be at any point in RD. And if we care about things like genre formation, then we're going to need to model the fact that you know, different producers might cater to different users. And so then this complicates things because we need to consider at least some sort of asymmetric user behaviors at equilibrium, uh, where you know, not everyone is doing the same thing. So uh, I guess the final part of this model is we need to talk about uh, producer uh, costs and profit, right? So a producer could just kind of win by taking the norm of their vector to infinity, right? Because this will make the dot product big. Um, this is obviously not what we want. And so we model this by saying that, you know, there's some cost to producing content. So uh, in particular, you know, I can't just make everything good at once for free. Um, I'm going to, you know, take some norm. So this could be L1 norm, the L2 norm, whatever you want. And I'll raise it to some power. Uh, generally, this power should be bigger than one because we want to, uh, you know, encode the fact that it's kind of increasing marginal cost to competing along every dimension at once. I can't just like be good at everything, or maybe I could, but in those cases, we shouldn't expect interesting behavior. We should just expect kind of a single genre because you just want to be good at everything at once. Um, and so with all of these put together, the profit function is the following. So the profit that producer J gets, if uh, conditional on what all the other producers do in the users is going to just be the number of users that they win. So we'll assume that it's something like a movie where you're selling things at some fixed cost minus the cost of production. Um, since this is a digital good, this is a one-time cost because we're imagining there's a kind of large upfront cost to produce content, but it's then cheap to duplicate or distribute. So this is the overall model. Um, so are there any questions about, uh, about this model before I kind of go into results? So there's a question online that mm -hmm. I'll read out. It says, how do you tie break between producers? Okay, good. So um, I guess it's going to turn out that the equilibria will investigate don't really have ties, at least with non-zero probability. Uh, but if you did have to tie break, uh, we would just pick randomly among uh, all of the possibilities. Uh, yeah, good, good question. Uh, any others? Uh, yes. Um, so in terms of the producer cost function, what exactly are the features meant to represent and why are you taking like, and you know, this idea that you can make it arbitrarily large rather than just by bounding the, the norm? Right. So there's a couple, there's a couple different settings where we would kind of have this cost function representing different things. So in the movie case, it would basically be, you know, like different axes along which a movie could you know, be good. So like things like cinematography, like plot, uh, I don't know, like the actors themselves, things like that. Um, and so then, you know, the sense, like the reason why you would imagine things are super linear is like a film only has like so many minutes. So you kind of have to decide what you're gonna focus on. Um, another example might be if say you are, I don't know, just say, just recommending content to people then you might uh, be able to kind of have better content if you collect, like if, uh, how do I want to put this? So basically like you imagine you might have like different amounts of, if, if we want to kind of model an imperfect information setting, you can imagine you have like different amounts of data about each user and, or each user type. And the more data you have about a type, kind of the higher quality, you know, content you're giving to that user. Um, and so then the cost is going to be something like the cost of you know data collection. Um, so that might be another another example. Yeah. Uh, yes. Deb. Can I ask a quick question? Oh sure. Yeah. Uh, should the cost? I mean, uh, what properties of the cost function are you going to use going ahead? Uh, I'm basically just going to use that it's an oil well, a power of a norm. So okay. the reason for that is at some point I'm going to want to take a dual norm. Mm -hmm. um and was, it turns out that have, oh sorry go have you thought about like using some order functions because it does seem in this context the costs would be diminishing returns um, so once you have tom cruise and you have good cinematography the rest doesn't matter so much <laughs> <laughs> um well so that would be in the i guess so i think that would be more about the user utility 
Um, so the, the, co the cost is like the cost of production. Um, so I think you're saying like, once I have a couple of good things, then uh, maybe there's like diminishing returns to more good things. Uh, so I agree that's kind of a limitation here. That would be more in uh, kind of this part where we're assuming linearity. Um, so I, I, mean, I think I would basically agree with that. Um, I guess I'd just say, you know, these linear things uh, got us pretty far historically. So the net, you know, the original Netflix challenge was mostly won by linear things. Um, so I think later people realize you do want to add nonlinear effects. Um, so we're, we're basically not doing that here, but I, I kind of agree with your point. Uh, yeah, my question was around uh, the number of users won. So they're either like won or lost. I'm mm -hmm. curious if you guys thought about um, like maybe like number of minutes watched or just some, like more of like a functional relationship between, you know, the degree to which uh, you have a user kind of bought in. And if that matters, it might not matter for profit. I'm curious, actually. Yeah, so I think um, like you could you could do that. Um, trying to think how it would like change any of our results, I guess. Um, well, so one thing is that actually the like discontinuity here kind of complicates the study of equilibria because even establishing existence is kind of tricky. So it might actually be a bit easier to analyze things if, if you had more continuous metrics. Um, on the other hand, it also, you know, makes the math a bit harder because you have to kind of account for that. Um, my guess is that it doesn't change the story a ton, but I think, yeah, I need, I need to, I, maybe I shouldn't say that because I need to think in a bit more detail. Um, but basically, yeah, I, I think this is a thing you should you should consider doing. And, and basically, we're just trying to make things as simple as possible. So we started with this. Uh, yes. Sorry, I guess just related to the last question, am I understanding the model correctly? Can, can... Oh. Hi, as, as I guess related to the last question, if I understand correctly, can't you just like treat each user as like a user minute instead? Like, let's say each I is a minute mm. of a specific user and then just create a lot of duplicates or something. Or maybe then n will blow up too big and somehow that's bad. Or I, I think you can do that if you don't model dependencies between the minutes. So, so the issue is like you might think that like if you've watched for a while, you might stop at some point. Um, so you could probably model some effects that way. But I think probably to get at like Deb's full point, you'd need to have uh, have some dependencies. OK, thanks. Yeah. Would it be straightforward to say that users just choose proportional, like they sample an item proportional to their Christian similarity? Yeah, so you can also do this, like having a soft max instead of a hard max. In fact, um, there's some concurrent work uh, by other people at Berkeley, um, Carl Krauth and, uh, and some other people who I'm blanking on. I'm sorry, I should have included the citation here. But um, yeah, basically uh, you can do this. Uh, Oh, Sarah Dean's one of the other people, but but anyways, you can do this. It, it kind of leads to a different analysis. Um, I, I'm I'm probably not going to get into that in that talk, but that's another possibility. Um, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe one last question that I want to. Oh, just this seems to be getting at the distinction between a user enjoying content versus actually getting shown by the recommender system in the first place, which seems to be. Yeah, so I guess we're yeah we're not making that distinction right here. Um, I guess partly because we're assuming that the producer is perfect. Um, but if we're imperfect, you'd want to do that. Um. Okay, these are great questions, but I just want to go on since I'm on slide three of, of 15. Um, okay, uh, so let me just like tell you about some of the things that can happen in this setting. Uh, so I guess first let's just take like the simplest case. Uh, D equals one, N equals one user. Uh, so we just have like one dimensional preferences. What this means is basically there's just like one axis of quality. All you care about is like how high the quality is. What's going to happen? Um, well, I guess, the first thing you realize is that question about ties starts to matter now because this kind of, it turns out actually there's like no pure strategy equilibria here. Why not? Well, uh, basically you're going to, you know, play the highest, uh, you know, who, it's basically like whoever plays a higher number wins. Um, and then if you're not, so if you play the higher number, then uh, you know, you're happy. But if you play the lower number, then you'd like rather just play zero because there's some cost of production, right? So like you don't want to play 0.9 if your opponent plays one. So if you had 0.9 and one, the 0.9 would like to play zero. But then the one is like, man, I really didn't want to play one because I could have won by just playing 0.1. 
Um, but then, you know, you're just going to end up in a cycle. If they're down at point one, uh, you're going to go back up to point two. And you might think, OK, I can fix this with ties. But the problem is with ties, then maybe you, like both people play point five or something. But then if either of the point fives went up to point six, they're suddenly winning again. So tie, like having ties and random set ties doesn't really fix this. Um, so there's actually no even asymmetric pure strategy equilibria here. And so you need uh, mixed strategy equilibria. And it actually turns out once you're willing to have mixed strategy equilibria, you can have symmetric mixed strategy equilibria. So we can actually assume everyone plays the same random strategy. I said we need to somehow have you know, some sort of asymmetry in what people do. And so the nice thing here is actually the asymmetry is going to come out in the realization of that randomness. And so we'll be able to get genres by you know, looking at the support of this mixed strategy equilibrium and seeing that the support you know, has different directions and higher dimensional settings. In each of those directions is going to be one of the genres. So this is kind of this nice thing that uh, actually, even though we have to study asymmetric phenomena, which are often quite challenging, we can actually get away uh, with symmetric things as long as we're mixed. And we're kind of forced to be mixed because of this discontinuity. Uh, so having said that, let's just talk about what actually happens in this one dimensional setting before kind of going into all of that. So you have uh, a unique symmetric mixed equilibrium. The CDF is this kind of power law. So uh, the probability of being you know, less than or equal to some value P grows as P to the beta over P minus one. So this means it's going to uh, grow uh, more kind of super linearly as beta increases, less super linearly as P increases. And so you get kind of curves uh, like this. Uh, so say this, this is for P equals two producers. So if we have two producers, uh, beta is one, then it turns out both producers just pick this uniform distribution. Uh, as beta increases, then they kind of go more towards kind of uh, playing pretty close to one. Um, why is that? Well, because you can actually be pretty close to one before you start incurring costs, so you might as well be there, but there's still this kind of randomization. And so, um, and so here, producers are just competing on quality. OK, so this is kind of the sim simple warm-up setting. Um, so are there any questions about what's going on here? How am I doing on time? I have like 20 minutes? Yeah, 20, 25. OK, cool. Yeah. Great. Um, OK, so let's see what happens in higher dimensions. Because actually, even in two dimensions, you get something pretty interesting. So the 2D example will assume there's two users. They're either 1, 0, or 0, 1. So basically, user 1 only cares about the first property of the content. User 2 only cares about the second quality, uh, property. And we'll assume that there's two producers. So one of two things intuitively, we might expect one of two things intuitively to happen. One is that uh, it turns out that it's kind of cheaper to just be good at everything at once. And we should just uh, kind of, you know, everyone should compete to make both producers happy. Or you might think that what's going to happen is that, you know, one person goes after one producer, one person goes after the other. I guess to keep that as like a mixed strategy equilibrium, then this would have to be kind of like a superposition of these two lines. Um, it turns out this is sort of what happens, but not quite. So uh, for small values of beta, for beta less than or equal to two, uh, taking the cost function to be the L2 norm you end up with a single genre. Now this kind of makes sense, right? Because like, let's think about what happens if beta is like 0.5 or say 1.5, right? Then your cost is gonna be like P1 squared plus P2 squared to the one over, or sorry, to the uh, 1.5 over two. And so, you know, this is kind of like additive across the two dimensions, but then you're taking it to some power that's less than one. So it's basically saying that costs are sub additive across dimensions. So actually like the more you've done on one dimension, the less the cost is of doing another dimension. So it actually makes a lot of sense that, you know, you would only compete on one genre. And so really it's like beta bigger than two that is kind of the interesting regime here. And so uh, in that regime, you actually end up with support that is on uh, a circle of some fixed radius. So it's still one dimensional support. Uh, there's interestingly, infinitely many genres. Uh, although 
you can kind of see like uh, it is kind of like mixing between these two directions. And then the final thing is that you can also look at the profit that the producers get at equilibrium. So normally in a competitive market in sort of traditional models of competition, if you even have two firms at equilibrium, uh, you should have zero profit. But here, because of the sort of heterogeneity of the users, this isn't true anymore. Basically, intuitively, if I expect kind of that I'm going to go after one user, but the other person might go after the other user, I'm actually not incentivized to like give all of you know my revenue back as value to the user. Like I should actually be able to get some profit because there's some chance that I'm not competing with anyone. And so that's actually what we see here uh, at exactly the phase transition where you go, th this isn't true in general, but in this case, at exactly the phase transition where you go from this kind of single genre equilibrium to this infinite genre equilibrium, you go from zero profit to uh, non-zero profit. Um, OK, so any questions about what's going on in this two-dimensional case? Ah, uh, yes. Does it collapse down? Like, there's some point where it goes from this line to the other direction. Is it, does it collapse to a point at some point in the middle? But so you mean, like, say, as the number of producers increases? Uh, even for, the, for this case, like, mm -hmm. you, sorry. Oh, I see. You're saying, is it like a stark transition or not? Yeah. Yeah. So what happens is that when beta equals two, there's actually many Nash equilibria, okay. which include both the line and the circle. I see. When beta is less than two, there's only one Nash equilibrium. And when beta is greater than two, I think we, did we prove this? I'm pretty sure there's only one when beta is greater than two as well. Um, or certainly I believe that. I don't remember whether we proved that or not, but th this is like sort of what you should think of the picture as being. Uh, cool. Uh, okay, let me also maybe make one other point, uh, which is about how this kind of changes as we increase the number of producers. So, I showed you what happened when there were two producers, but you can actually have uh, kind of, well, I, I think it's useful to just understand what happens as the number of producers increases. So when, when there's two producers, you have this equilibrium that's like uh, supported on this quarter circle. Here, here, I'm not drawing the density, I'm just drawing the support. Um, you can compute the density, but just for simplicity, uh, we're just looking at what the support looks like. So it's always one dimensional. Um, once you have three users, actually now the support is like this line, and then it becomes convex as you have more users. And what happens is that as the number of producers goes to infinity, then you actually end up uh, having this like more and more convergence towards the coordinate axes. So this story about how you know maybe people should just uh, compete for one user or the other. It, okay, so when that turned out not to be true when there were only two producers, but once you have like really a perfectly competitive market where there's infinitely many people competing, then you actually do end up uh, with things on the coordinate axis. And it actually converges to like the sort of uh, strategy, like the realization of what you see converges to this sort of Poisson process. And uh, I guess I can kind of show that here. Um, so actually maybe before I say, uh, yeah, maybe before I go to that Poisson process, I guess the other kind of interesting thing you could ask about is what happens as uh, we pick kind of like user preferences that are like more aligned with each other, right? So instead of picking like two users that are orthogonal where like they each care about totally different things, what happens if uh, they're kind of more aligned? Um, we'll get to like the formal statements about that later, but basically what happens is that this like critical value of beta where you switch from single genre to multi-genre uh, in sort of uh, increases because there's kind of more incentive to kind of cater to both people at once if they're more similar. Um, so what I'm showing here, I guess, is this Poisson process for kind of different possible uh, alignments between the users. So uh, this is the case where you have uh, two uh, users that are orthogonal. Uh, as, as I kind of said, what happens is that all producers will either be on you know, the x-axis or the y-axis. 
Um, this purple curve here that you can kind of see shows you like the CDF along this axis. And then if things are kind of less orthogonal, you actually get these like really goofy equilibria that are like piecewise constant. It's we were like really surprised this happened. Actually, it took us like like embarrassingly long to work out uh, that this was the answer. But you get these equilibria whose uh, CDF is actually like piecewise polynomial and also supported on two lines. But the two lines are actually not uh, exactly the uh, users uh, themselves. So what happens is that you kind of get lines that are like a little bit in the interior of the user vectors. Um, so sorry, that might have been a bit of a mouthful. But this is just to like illustrate that you actually can get like pretty interesting phenomena with these equilibria. Um, yes, in the back. Uh, what parameter is varying in the first three plots? So, oh, good, good, great question. So, can you repeat uh, the question, please? Uh, the question was what parameter is varying in the first three plots? So, um, the thing that is varying is the angle between the two users. So, before, I, I guess this was the thing I was saying about user alignment. So before we were assuming the users were like the like one zero and zero one, but now I'm taking the users to actually be I guess given by these uh, the black vectors here. So here they have an angle of like pi over four point three between each other. Here they have an angle of pi over four between each other. Here they have an angle of pi over three point five between each other. Um, there's a fixed value of beta. I forget what, what beta value we use to generate this, but basically beta is fixed and this like angle between the users is varying. And we're seeing how this affects what the producers do. Ah, uh, yes, in the back. Um, can you give any intuition for why these pieces show up? Like what explains that this, that, yeah. Uh, so I don't have great intuition, I guess as evidenced by the fact that it took us a long time to figure this out. Um, it's possible that Mina has better intuition than me. I guess one thing I can say is that these are exactly orchestrated so that the uh, projection onto one axis or the other is exactly like a gives you a disjoint union. That's exactly everything. Um, it seems like somehow that ends up there's some math that like kind of tells you that you should want that to happen. I don't know intuitively why you should want that to happen. Um, but I think, yeah, kind of intuitively what's happening is like the equilibrium is trying to cover each user individually kind of exactly once. Uh, yes, in the back. Um, and, and sorry, maybe just to clarify. So you said this is, uh, you said you mentioned something about a Poisson process. Can you, is that in this picture? And if so, can you explain yeah so, uh, oops. yeah, so basically, uh, what happens is P goes to infinity. So basically, with probability approaching one, so for any fixed producer, with probability approaching one, they just pick the zero vector. They kind of have to do this, because if, if the probability of picking something non-zero was not like vanishing, then basically everyone, like, you know, infinitely many people are trying something, only two of them can win then everyone's getting like negative profit almost certainly and that that kind of doesn't work so it has to be the case that from the perspective of any fixed producer uh you're going to uh get uh you're going to be like zero almost always so the distribution i'm showing instead is the winner's distribution what i mean by this is like conditional on winning one of the users so conditional on being one of the you know two people that are like uh, getting one of the users, uh, what is your density? Um, and that corresponds to, I think there's a way to like relate that to the, like also limiting, I guess the other thing you could have done as a limit is to kind of like look at what everyone, you know, plays and then see what measure that uh, limits out to. And this is kind of pretty closely tied to this winner's distribution. Um, great. Any other questions? Okay. So let me jump into so, like like these are kind of examples, but let me jump into some more uh, general theory. So uh, okay, right. So the kind of two phenomena that I want to characterize here 
The first is when you get uh, kind of zero versus non-zero profit. Actually, we'll get to that later. The other one that is what we're going to cover first is where this phase transition happens. So when do we go from like one genre to more than one genre? So it turns out that actually we can like exactly characterize when you'll have one genre and when you'll have more than one genre. So uh, there, uh, it's going to turn out to be related to like the duality of a search optimization problem. So I, get, I need to set up a bit of notation to kind of tell you what's going on here. So basically uh, we're going to let uh, this given a producer P, we're going to let Y of P be basically the vector of realized user values. Uh, so that like U1 P is like the value of P to user one, uh, UN is the value of P to user N, except I'm going to raise them to the power of beta. Um, so this is now this kind of like slightly weird nonlinear function. And I'm going to define the set S beta to just be the image of the unit norm ball uh, of this Y of P function. So basically I'm you know, taking everything in the unit ball. I'm looking at the values that the users get from that. I'm going to raise it to the beta power element wise. So uh, the theorem is that you basically get more than one genre exactly when the convex hull of this set is kind of large compared to the set itself. So uh, if we let S bar beta be the convex hull of S beta, then all symmetric equilibria are multi-genre if and only if the following holds that the maximum of the sum from i equals one to n of log yi over this uh, convex hull is strictly bigger than the maximum uh, of the sum of yi over s beta itself. So this, if s beta was already convex, then certainly you would have equality here. So this, then everything would have to be single genre. That's kind of why say like, for instance, this would imply for like the L2 norm, uh, or, uh, uh, I was going to say something false, but in, in <laughs> roughly it would imply for like say the LP norm or say the LQ norm that if beta is less than or equal to Q, then you know, you're going to have strong duality. Um, there's a slight wrinkle there, but this is basically true. Um, and then, you know, in general, even if it's not convex, sometimes you might have strong duality. Uh, and so it's really when this doesn't hold that you get, uh, that you're kind of uh, get multiple genres. So this is the result. I guess a, a few things that are worth noting here. So um, this can actually be computed efficiently because uh, we're taking log of yi, right? So even though there's this beta here, once I'm taking logs that like falls out and it's just a linear term. So this I can compute efficiently. This is not clear can compute efficiently. It is maximizing a con k function over a convex set. So there's some hope, but it's not like trivial to generate a linear separation oracle for this convex set. So uh, you can't, it, it's, I think this is actually a somewhat interesting computational question, but it, it's at least not obvious if you can compute this quickly. Um, the final thing is that this function is actually the like Nash welfare for those of you who are familiar with bargaining theory. So it's kind of interesting that uh, this competitive equilibrium gives you something similar to a bargaining solution. Uh, just to give some intuition about these sets S beta. So if we took, uh, you know, these, uh, this like simple setting from before of one, zero and zero, one as the two user vectors, then here's what S beta looks like as we change beta. So it starts out uh, looking like this circle, then it becomes this triangle, and then eventually it becomes concave. Um, and this green thing is the difference between the convex hole and the set itself. Um, and then as you get vectors that have like a smaller angle between them, then the point at which you kind of, you know, depart from your convex hole actually happens later. And so this is like part of the intuition in this theorem that the more vectors are kind of pointing in the same direction, the more you should expect to have a single genre equilibrium. Ah, yes. Uh, so you talked about the two extremes of one genre and infinitely many. Are there any regimes where you see sort of finitely many but greater than one? Yeah. So um, if you have only two users, 
then the only time that can happen is with infinitely many producers, in which case you have two genres. So basically in the two user case, there's like three things that can happen, one, two, or infinity. Um, and you and like you can actually prove this. Um, for more than two users, I think it's less clear. I mean, I guess my conjecture would be that if you have n users, then the number of genres is probably either an in, like either between one and n or infinite. Um, but I this is like uh, I I take this as like a somewhat tentative conjecture. But th this is what I believe should be true. But uh, I, I think we really don't know right now. Um, okay. Uh, so I guess, you know, if, if you're not happy with these kind of complicated sets, there's also some sufficient conditions that are kind of more directly in terms of just like norms and stuff that we're used to. Uh, so one corollary you can get out of this is if you define this quantity Z, which is just uh, the sum of the uh, normalized user vectors under the dual norm of whatever norm you were using, then all equilibrium are multi-genre as long as z is less than n to the one minus one over beta. Um, so I guess first of all, kind of trivially, z is less than or equal to n because each of these vectors is like a unit norm, and we're adding them up. So if a triangle inequality is at most n, it'll be exactly equal to n only if all of the users are identical. So that's sort of saying if they're all identical, you're definitely going to be single genre. If they were orthogonal or random, then Z would be something like root N for the L2 norm. And so then you're saying like when beta is like two plus little o of one, you're going to uh, have uh, you're going to have these multi-genre equilibria. That's kind of the smallest you could hope for kind of for this reason we said before. And so, uh, you know, in between, you get something in between. Um, I guess I kind of mentioned this already. Sometimes S beta is just like convex no matter what the users are, in particular for L, LP norms, if beta is less than or equal to P. Um, I guess the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, this kind of producer profit thing, right? So we had this interesting phenomenon where producers can achieve non zero profit. It sort of seemed related to the emergence of the genre. So can we formalize this? Uh, we can in, in some sense. So I guess first I can give a general sufficient condition for positive profit, although um, it's not clear if this is as tight as this Z condition I gave before, but we can say, okay, let Q be the maximum amount that any producer can align with all of the users, right? So basically I want, I want a producer that is sort of simultaneously having high dot product with every user at once. Um, because I'm taking this min here. So here, if Q is less than N to the negative P over beta, the expected profit at equilibrium must be strictly positive. Uh, this is, you know, Q is always going to be strictly less than one unless all of the users are fully aligned. As beta goes to infinity, P over beta goes to zero. So the right-hand side will approach one. And so in particular, for sufficiently large beta, you'll always get strictly positive profit. Um, so, uh, the kind of overall interpretation here is that if users are more spread out, Q will be smaller, it will be easier to get profit. Yep. Um, another more direct connection between genres and profit is that multiple genres are actually necessary for positive profit. So, uh, if, uh, some equilibrium mu is a single genre equilibrium, then all producers actually receive zero expected profit at that equilibrium. Another thing you can show that kind of, uh, just follows from a symmetry argument is that the profit, if there's n users and p producers, it's always at most n over p. So also as the number of producers goes to infinity, actually profit gets driven down to zero. Um, so that's pretty much everything I have. So just to summarize, we created this uh, fairly simple model, but that had these two key properties of high dimensionality and heterogeneity. These are already enough to give you like pretty diverse and interesting phenomena. I really think, I think there's just like a lot to study here. I, I mean, like, I think these results are interesting, but I think it's like really just scratching the surface of, of what's going on here. And, and so there's a lot more that we could understand. So, you know, I, I'd be very interested to chat with people who, who would be interested in, uh, in thinking about this more. Um, we kind of have these two resulting phenomena of genres and positive profit. And I think there's just like many open questions, e even beyond these, you know, understanding not just the 
uh, producer profit, but how user utility depends on, say, the number of producers or things like that. Um, and then some of the questions that you all were bringing up at the beginning of this talk, um, right? What happens if the recommendations are noisy? Um, can we like generally characterize the shape of equilibria support? Um, what happens if like people are like learning these equilibria rather than you know just like get into it right away? Um, so I think there's a lot to study here. Um, I think I'll end there and, and take questions. Um, have you considered the setting when there are different weights to the users, for example, signifying that your user subpopulations might have different numbers of members in them or other settings where like maybe like clusters of users who are kind of similar to each other and uh, I'd be really interested to know how that impacts genre formation. Yeah, um, so let's see, what can I say there? So uh, you can basically incorporate weights here by just, you know, like, if I have, if I want like 30% of the users to be from one and 70% of the other, I can just have like 0.3 n from one, 0.7 from the other. I mean, really, I guess what you probably want is like a user distribution rather than just a finite set. Um, I think uh, to your question, we don't understand a ton about the cluster thing. It was actually one of the early things uh, we were interested in, but then even like this two user case ended up being quite uh, mathematically challenging. Um, I think, you know, these like, I guess like these kinds of theorems on like, uh, on genres, it turns out like this is kind, this as stated is kind of weak for the case where you have two clusters, but there's a kind of improved, uh, a, like an improved result that tries to get at cluster structure. So I think we know a little bit about like this kind of cluster structure with like one versus more than one, but I think we know very little about the shape of the equilibrium. I think like most of that is just totally open. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm curious how much, uh, cause this is for, uh, like media distribution platforms like mm -hmm. Spotify and Netflix. I'm curious, um, how much you guys uh, thought about online, other online platforms. So one I'm thinking of is like e-commerce platforms where you're talking about the diversity of like vendors and, uh, you have other variables like, you know, the price of particular artifacts and not just like a, like a subscription price. And then also, um, another thing I'm thinking about is, um, uh, social media platforms where um, you have like user generated content. And so um, it seems like just like qualitatively reflecting on it, it seems like those are platforms where like, if you think of like TikTok or YouTube, uh, people actually like, there's a lot of homogenization that happens on these platforms. Like people will uh, conform to like trends or all like collapse into like, you know, single genres for a period of time um, that things are popular so that they can, uh, accumulate or pick up users that seem to like similar things that for periods of time versus diversify. So I'm just curious about how much of this is like dependent on the characteristics of the platform and, um, or if there's something about like sort of these like subscription based media distribution platforms that like drew you guys specifically. Um, yeah, sorry, that was a big yeah. question, but. <laughs> uh, yeah, so let me try to kind of break that down into a few things. So I guess um, maybe the easiest is talking about uh, kind of like having prices versus no prices. Yeah. So I would intuitively think that, that I mean, it might change some of the profit results. I'd intuitively think that like, it's not gonna make a huge difference to the phenomena you see, but, but that's kind of speculation. Okay. I think the things that make bigger differences are, are the other two things you mentioned, right? So I guess one other attribute of the e-commerce case is that sellers are actually selling physical goods. So there's an actual cost per good rather than this one-time cost. Mm -hmm. I think that can change things potentially a lot, uh -huh. um, especially for things like uh, user utility, uh, right? So in some sense, like I actually want it to be the case that there's you know some big company that invested like a ton in this movie that can be amortized across you know millions of people because then the movie is going to be higher quality. Mm -hmm. um, and so like, kind of, you know, the movie industry like kind of naturally tends towards like a sort of small number of companies. You might have a much larger set of suppliers once there's like non-fixed costs of production. Um, so I think that could change things a lot. And then your final point I think is super interesting on uh, kind of homogenization. Uh, I think you are intuitively right that competition, at, especially between platforms, although potentially also if you have kind of 
learning dynamics can create periods of homogenization. Um, we're doing some follow-up work to try to model some of those effects. Um, so I'd be happy to chat offline if you want to hear more about that. I think one last question and then we'll take a break. Hi, uh, Jacob. Yeah, actually, my question is about the learning aspects of it, like, because mm -hmm. um, you there are some of these like piecewise equilibria and so on and so forth, like, it looks like there's very interesting behavior. So I wonder if you guys have tried things like using simple learning algorithms or like multiplicative weights or something like do you also does it, I don't know, does it affect like the kinds of equilibria you converge to or. Yeah, so. Yeah. So we only like very recently started thinking about this. Um, I guess what I can say is that uh, things actually things become, I think, more complicated once you have learners. So in fact, even what you converge to, uh, okay, even if I say everyone's a no regret learner, uh, it seems, although I, like we really just started thinking about this, but it seems like you can converge to different things depending on like how quickly one side versus the other uh like has their regret decaying so i think basically like equilibrium become much more complicated in the learning setting um that, that that's about all all i kind of know is that it, it seems more complicated but i i think it's a good question okay we'll take further questions offline thank you very much We'll, uh, we have a tea break now and we'll resume at four o'clock. <laughs>